coming up on Theater Talk. You mentioned Shakespeare earlier with the foreshadowing, of course, because we get a lot of that in Shakespeare. I mean, we begin with Macbeth, with the witches, yeah. telling Macbeth what is going to happen to him. Yes, yes, it's... it's um uh, too bad he misses the C-section. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And Susan, we're going to have a little bit of a departure from Theater Talk. It's going to be a bit um, like a book club, I think, today. We are delighted to be joined by the celebrated novelist John Irving, out with a new book, Avenue of Mysteries. He is, of course, the author of The World According to Garp, The Hotel New Hampshire, and one of my favorites, In One Person. And Mr. Irving does have a theatrical background, which we'll explore. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Uh, one thing we have to clear up, no relation to Henry Irving, right? The uh, great English uh, uh, Shakespeare. Not that I know. Not that you know. Okay. Um, before we get to Avenue of Mysteries, I am interested in your childhood because you grew up around the theater, I believe, an amateur theater that your mother was involved with. I, I, I did grow up around a small town playhouse uh, in, in New Hampshire, um, which had the added advantage of the fact that the actors repeatedly were um, townspeople whom everyone knew. And <laughs> we, we knew them, of course, in their so-called real lives. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was the prompter, <laughs> which was um, uh, a job she was well suited for. Because <laughs> she was, as a mother, always prompting me. <laughs> um, do this, do that. No, not that. Do this. Um, and, and she was very precise uh, and uh, did not uh, withhold her opinions. So she was quite a good uh, prompter. And I often, after school, would go to the theater and um, do my homework while actors were rehearsing. Um, and my grandfather um, was often on stage. You know, in those days, um, many of the female roles were still played by men. And then really? in other times, uh, at other times, um, it was just a lark or just for fun. Right. It, this um, was in Exeter? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the town no of. Had no relationship. No relationship to the school. So, yeah. And the role, f f female roles were played by men? Not, not always or, or often, but sometimes. Sort just, of like a Charlie's Ant kind of a thing? Well, like? not even. It was, it, it was just occasionally. And, and I remember um, my, my grandfather uh, on stage as a woman. In fact, I have photographs of him. But forgetting the, the small town theater part, that, you know, I. I read Shakespeare, I read the Greek classical dramas, and before I imagined uh, being a novelist, before I read those great novels of the 19th century that made me want to be a writer of that kind, mm -hmm. um, uh, I found the kind of structure uh, in Sophocles, in Euripides, in Shakespeare, the, the kind of structure to the storytelling, the kind of foreshadowing mm -hmm. that I would find reflected in those 19th century novels. Things in the theater, of course, are dramatized, mm -hmm. but so were those 19th century novels. That's Dickens right. was a very theatrical writer. Mm -hmm. um, Hardy set things up uh, in a dramatic way. Um, and they were also connected to the theater. Dickens loved the theater. Dickens did. And Hardy adapted many of his uh, novels into plays that were done um, in the amateur theater in the town where he was living. Correct. I read that you referred to 19th century novels in that you still write novels that are developed and long rather than the more modern sensibility of... Well, how, how would you define the modern sensibility which you do not follow? I wouldn't define the modern sensibility right. be, because I, I had, it seemed a curse when I was much younger, but that, that my earliest models, my heroes as writers, 
were, were these writers who were long dead, which marked me as uh, old-fashioned or out of date before I began. <laughs> um, but there's a great advantage to that as a young writer as you go forward in that there's no danger of your sounding like the writers you love. Hmm. They're a century or more gone. You couldn't sound like them if you tried. The language has changed. And so you can imitate their architecture, their way of constructing a story. But the language will not betray how closely you are imitating an essence of them. It's, it's, it's difficulty for many young writers if your heroes are of your own time. Um, think of how many not very good writers have modeled themselves on Hemingway. Yeah. Um, or attempted a Scott Fitzgerald. And, and it's, you know, uh, there was no danger in that uh, uh, for me. I could, um, uh, I was uh, imitating um, writers who most of my classmates in school and in college uh, didn't like to read. I'm interested in this, uh, you mentioned Shakespeare earlier with the foreshadowing, of course, because we get a lot of that in Shakespeare. I mean, we begin with Macbeth, with the witches, yes. telling Macbeth what is going to happen to him. Yes, yes, it's, it's um, uh, too bad he misses the C-section. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> one, now, yeah. one thing I'm struck with in this novel and also in, I, I reread uh, Garp recently, and thinking about you're interested in, in Shakespeare, but also in Dickens. Balzac, too, is another novelist of the 19th century I, I love. Uh, the importance of dialogue in the books. Yes. You know, I, I, when I was, I was rereading, uh, reading for the first time, I should say, Heartbreak House earlier this year. And you think, oh, this big novel is going to take forever. But it zips along because so much of it is dialogue. And in Garp, too, dialogue drives it. That's a... I don't know, a theatrical sensibility on your part to emphasize the I think it's, it's uh, even as a kid, I liked uh, going to see plays, even not very good plays, uh, better than I liked uh, going to see movies. Um, it's odd that I, I do like writing screenplays. Um, I enjoy it, uh, perhaps because they're so visual, and my writing has always been visual. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I wince a little when people say, that my writing, uh, that my novels are very cinematic um, mm -hmm. because it's not the cinema that I got that visualization from. Um, 19th century novels are hugely visual. Mm -hmm. Hardy is very visual. Mm -hmm. Dickens is very visual. Um, the desire to make people see exactly something uh, is all the more important if what you want them to see is hard to believe. If you make those details convincing, mm. they will believe what is hard to believe. And that is a matter of visualization. As much as I loved going to the theater and as much as I loved the amateur acting I did as a uh, high school student and as a college student, um, I never tried to write a play and knew very well that I probably couldn't because the strength of visualization, which I feel is one of my greatest strengths as a, as a writer, um, is of no avail to me in writing a play. Uh, you have to make everything happen through that dialogue. You have to create character through dialogue. And that I can do. Mm -hmm. The yes. character through dialogue I can do. But the visualization of the story always meant more to me. So it's ironic that I end up often writing screenplays because they are within my visual range as a writer. It's simply a novel in a smaller window of time, all in the present tense. Did you ever think about maybe a, being a set designer when you were hanging around the theater? Then you could have created a visual yeah. element. Yes and no. Um, it, it didn't engage me the way writing visual, uh, visually engaged me, the way making it happen with the language. 
um, engage me. Were you attracted to the acting at all? You said you acted amateurly. And, oh, I did, but, but as I soon as those... I mean, you're a good-looking guy. You've got kind of matinee idol looks. Yeah, but as soon as those 19th century novels became the model of the form for me, I thought, well... If I do this, I get to be all the characters. <laughs> and you've also commented that you, that you enjoy spending time alone, and that's key for a novelist. It sure is, because you, you, you better in, enjoy being alone, because that's where you're going to spend right, whereas most in the, of your the, life. Right, whereas in the movies, you, you, you have very little control past a point. So unless, unless you write um, and, and direct. Uh, I'm working now on uh, my first uh, teleplay. Um, I'm, uh, I was writing The World According to Garp 40 years ago, and it's, it's odd to go back that far in time because I'm working for um, uh, Warner Brothers and HBO on an on a, um, adaptation of The World According oh to Garp as, going to be like as a, a mini series. Right. And the mini series has always attracted me. Uh, structurally, architecturally, which I talk about a lot, uh, the episodic quality of it mm -hmm. um, is much more suitable to a long novel or a longer novel. Nineteenth century novel than the feature length film Absolutely. ever was. And Dickens wrote the you know the the, the pamphlets. Yeah. They were essentially miniseries. And I that again I, I suppose my attraction to dramatizing. Uh, the action of a novel, the theatricality of my novels. It's, it's, it's very tempting to this, this teleplay structure of a five episode, somewhere between four and six episode series. Is, it's a very appealing structure to me. What struck me about Garp is that you were dealing with transgender people before it got into the zeitgeist, you do, you have a tra transgender character here also, and have in other books. But this, I mean, this was a theme when I read *The World According to Garp*, when it came out, was was it was new to me. It's interesting you mentioned that because that that's in in making the decision I I, I have to do this miniseries, which I was reluctant. Uh, to do at first. My first reaction when, when they talked to me about it was um, was to say, you know, a much younger and angrier person wrote that novel, mm -hmm. and you need a younger and angrier person than I am now uh, to uh, do this adaptation. Um, and um, I suggested someone, and... Uh, that was explored, but they came back to me and said, no, we, we want um, uh, you to do it. And a part of me felt, okay, uh, when George Roy Hill asked me to write that screenplay when he was making uh, Garp as a film in 1982, I knew George. I, I loved George. I liked his films. I like him. And we explored the considerable differences between how he saw the movie in that novel mm -hmm. and how that wasn't the movie I saw. I don't dislike that film, mm -hmm. but I always felt that the sexual violence, uh, the sexual warfare, it is after all a sexual assassination story. Uh, a mother is killed by a man who hates w women. Her son is murdered by a woman who hates men. Mm -hmm. um, if the sexual revolution really was one, um, where is all this hatred coming from? Uh, if we really are sexually liberated, gay and straight, um, uh, where does the hatred of uh, sexual differences uh, come from? Why is there so much sexual violence? Mm -hmm. Why is it so... Um, little acceptance of sexual minorities. I remember thinking very strongly when I finished uh, Garp as a novel, I th well, thank God I won't need to write about this again because surely this will all go away. <laughs> surely this will, you know, I, I worried that the novel would look antiquated. Obviously, if, if I had thought um, all the issues regarding sexual minorities was a thing of the past, 
uh, I wouldn't have written in one person. Right. And it was a little bit with a, a sinking heart that I thought, oh, here I go again. Here's, here's this again. And he's uh, a bisexual character in, in one person yes. with that identity. You know, I said to my wife, uh, thinking of not doing uh, this adaptation, I said, you know, nobody's going to ask me a third time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just, I just wanted you to finish one thought. You started, though, with about the Garp movie, and you were saying about the sexual anger and sexual rage. You don't feel that that movie captured it well enough? Is that, was that your, why you thought, uh, thought you and George Roy Hill might not work well together on it originally? You mentioned Roberta, the transgender woman who's so important in that story. I, I knew that uh, John Lithgow had the power as an actor to do more with her than George would probably do with that character. Um, beyond the comedy uh, that was played of her. Lithgow could have done anything and he, um, uh, and I, I regretted that, that I, we hadn't used um, or that I couldn't persuade George to see the role of Roberta as a larger one. She should have been, could have been, might have been, but, you know, I, I hesitate to say this because I passed, I declined. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Teschitz wrote that screenplay. I gave, Playwright. Yeah. I gave George and Steve my notes. I have, have always remained very uh, uh, close to... Uh, the making of that film, but close but detached. I, if 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 somebody offers you the job of the writer and you're not the writer, well, you, right. Essentially, you stay away. I think that's what you should do. And, um, but I would have wanted, suggested to George, making Roberta the voiceover character. <laughs> She's the only one who loves Garp and his mother equally. Yeah. She's also, in many ways, the most normal character uh, and the most even-tempered character, the most in control of her sexual anger of any character in the novel. She's the only character in the novel who could conceivably speak many of my narrative lines in the third person mm. about both Garp and Garp's mother, Jenny. Um, in her voice, you could have lifted some of my own lines about those characters. Yeah. Interesting. Um, That's how you're conceiving this mix. I'm conceiving it now as... Uh, the vo voiceover is, is also, for a, uh, a, long, a long story, mm -hmm. it's a great fast-forwarding device. Mm -hmm. um, you can cover a lot more ground. You can make a long story move more quickly. Um, and cover the gaps mm -hmm. with that uh, narrative voice. And um, so it's in her voice that we're hearing this. Oh, fascinating. Uh, Before we go, I want to get to Avenue of Mysteries. We're speaking of foreshadowing, masterful foreshadowing throughout this book. Two stories, really, that you're interweaving. I'm not giving anything away by saying that my favorite character in the book dies a gruesome death, which yeah. you... It's not the central character, but it's my favorite character. And my you, favorite character, too. You tell us that this character's going to die, and you tell us how the character's going to die, and still... We're shocked when we're it shocked happens. And we're going to it. In your planning of the structure of the book, when did that come in? I always see endings before I've worked out the beginnings. I never begin writing a novel until I've written the ending. Written it. I mean, the, the voice. I have to know what voice I'm in. I have to know how it sounds, not just what happens. Uh, so my novels, from the point of view of the writer, are always predetermined or predestined. Also connected to those 19th century stories I loved, and to Greek the theater, and to Shakespeare, I've always seen my role as, as, first, I have to make you like someone. I have to make you invested with some sympathy in what's going to happen to them. And when I feel I've made someone likable, if not wholly lovable, at least likable enough to have gained your sympathy. Engaging. Uh, because if you, they haven't gained your sympathy, you won't care what happens to them. Um, then I 
hope I can make you worry about what's going to happen to them, uh, because my novels are worst case and here's where, And here's where the foreshadowing comes in, the little bit of menace that flecks through on our way to what awful thing might happen. There, there is menace. Well, I wanted to ask you, as a novelist, you say, you know your ending, but on the way to that ending, do things happen that you have not expected? Small things. Characters take turns that you did not expect them to do? Very take? small things. So is that carefully plotted out that you've done before you launch into it? My novels wait quite a long time before I even begin writing them, so that by the time I say, all right, I'm writing you, I'm, I, I'm, I'm starting at chapter one now because I know everything that's ahead. I got it. I understand this. By the time I take that uncoupled boxcar out of the train station that's been sitting on a sidetrack for however long, unattached to any engine, by the time I say, okay, it's, it's you, it may have been there five, eight, ten years, certainly longer, usually, than the time it will take to write it once I do begin. And I don't write books quickly once I begin. This one's somewhat of an exception, um, because I began writing Avenue of Mysteries as a novel, always, like always, mm -hmm. knowing the ending. I wrote the last sentence and began this novel literally on Christmas Eve 2011. Mm -hmm. I finished the book in December of 2014, early December. Of the 14 novels, this is the quickest. It's misleading to say that, however, <laughs> because the Mexican story, the childhood and adolescence of Lupe and Juan Diego in Mexico uh, in 1970, that story uh, existed as a screenplay in many drafts over a 25-year period of time. Set in India originally, right? Used to be set in India. Because you went to India with used, some friends, I think. Used to be set uh, in, in India about Indian children, Indian performers uh, in Indian circuses. And when um, uh, the late Mary Ellen Marks' uh, husband, Martin Bell, the British-born filmmaker, when Martin and I failed to get that movie made in India, we relocated with Mary Ellen, once again our guide, her photographs mm -hmm. of child performers in Mexican circus, says now leading us there. Um, we relocated our story to Mexico where a number of its elements found a much more suitable home. The Jesuits, for example, mm -hmm. the Catholic Church, for example. Mm -hmm. And also what we found in Mexico, in addition to children at risk in circuses. When I say at risk, we're talking no safety net. <laughs> right, yes, okay. That's, <laughs> just to keep it simple. In addition to that, we found uh, the wonderful world of the dump, the basurero, where uh, there still today are children doing the picking and the sorting, uh, the work of separating the materials in the dump, uh, separating the plastic, uh, the aluminum, the copper, the glass, uh, doing the sorting and picking. Pepenadores, they're called. Same thing Sca in India, too. Scavengers, yeah. yes. Yeah. Scavengers. Um, Niños de la basura. Children of the rubbish, literally. Dump kids. And we thought, well, well, let's take a couple of dump kids and give them the option of going to the circus. <laughs> what would they choose? Would that be a good idea, et cetera? Uh, before we wrap it up, tempted at all to try a play at some point? For the reasons I've said no, uh, I, I, you just, you I, I think I'm I'm I, I think I'm too dependent as a writer on the visualization process. Has there been a stage um, adaptation of the Cider House Rules? I seem to recall. Yes, there some, was. Yeah, there've yeah. been there've been many theatrical um, adaptions. Uh, frankly, um, the very best theatrical ad adaptation of any of my novels I ever saw was in Finnish, um, in Helsinki, hmm. of the Hotel New Hampshire. Really? Oh, that's and, and not understanding a word of Finnish, uh, I understood everything. Aha. Uh -huh. And it was brilliant. It was just wonderful. 
Like there, there have been um, several different uh, theatrical adaptations of A Prayer for Owen Meany. Um, and the, the, the very long and very ambitious um, uh, adaptation that Peter Parnell and Tom Hulse oh, yeah, um, put yeah. together of, of the Cider House Rules. Um, but uh, the, I, I think the one that, that uh, uh, felt the, the closest or the truest to me was, was the, what, the, what the Finns did with um, the Hotel New Hampshire, uh, to the degree that um, that director and that uh, playwright, who also uh, worked together uh, in an opera format, or trying to put together an opera of a prayer for Owen Meany, the playwright doing the libretto, the director directing the opera. And I have my fingers crossed that they can um, pull that off. I, on the evidence of what I saw of Hotel New Hampshire, they you have reason to be hopeful. They can do it. A lot of producers watch this show, so uh, get that script and finish of a Hotel New Hampshire, <laughs> could easily be adapted for Broadway, I am sure. John Irving, thank you for being our guest on Theater thank Talk. You. The book is Avenue of Mysteries, out from Simon & Schuster. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.